Runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners only with Dom Harvey and Marcus Daniel. G'day, mate. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> hey, mate, it is so good. Thank you so much for coming over. I really appreciate it. Marcus Daniel, um, New Zealand's best male tennis player. Oh, I can't claim that mantle. Mike Venus uh, definitely pips me there. I'll claim number two. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, there's a there's a website called Pantheon. Do you know Pantheon? I don't. No. Uh, well, I just Googled it and it ranked New Zealand's GOAT tennis players, uh, <laughs> the greatest of all time. Um, this is a horrible opening question, but where do you think you would... Where do you think they, this website, Pantheon, placed you in terms of New Zealand's goats? Number one, Anthony Wilding. Yeah, that's without a doubt. It, I think it ultimately depends on how you weight singles versus doubles. Uh. So I'd, I think I'd put Mike Venus number two because he's won a Grand Slam. Interesting. Uh, I think I'd put Chris Lewis number three, finalist at, it was Wimbledon, right? Wimbledon finalist? Yeah, 83 I think it was. And by the way, you're dead right there. Chris Lewis is number three. Uh, are we? So I'm actually. My mind went straight to men. I should include. <laughs> you know, women. this is this is men. Sorry. Okay, the, men. Uh, I reckon I might be like number five or six. Ding ding ding! You are. So it's um Anthony Wilding, Oni Parent. Ah uh, yeah, I forgot Oni. Uh, yeah. Chris Lewis number three, Michael Venus number four, and you, Marcus Daniel number five. What about Kelly Evenden? Was he? I remember him. We were a tennis family growing up, so we had tennis on all the time. Should he not be ahead of you? I mean, the fact, <laughs> the fact that he did it on one lung, you know, like, yeah, 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 probably yeah. should be. Um, hey, it's great to have you here. Um, really, I, I hope this isn't embarrassing, but um, I want to I want to bring this up because um, I thought this was really cool. You you reached out to me about coming onto the podcast, and I I'm stoked about that. And you're not the first person to do that, um, and I really really appreciate it. Um, but that must mean there is something in particular you want to talk about, or get off your chest, or promote. What is it? Yeah, so Why this did you reach is, out? <laughs> this is, so we, we were speaking a little earlier about tall poppy syndrome. And so in 2020, I founded a nonprofit called High Impact Athletes. And I'm incredibly passionate about it. I believe that we have the potential to do a huge amount of good in the world. And basically, the realization that led me to want to start High Impact Athletes was I, I had been involved in the charity space for five or six years myself, donating a decent percentage of my own income to charity, but I'd never spoken about it public, publicly. And the reason I hadn't spoken about it was because I'm a Kiwi and I have tall puppy syndrome and I never wanted to sort of put myself out there as like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this, this thing that I think is good. Uh, but the realisation was by not talking about it, I may have just lost the opportunity to make more impact. You know, if, if someone enjoys the ideas, then maybe they'll start donating and, and making a positive impact on the world. And, you know, there, there was years of opportunity cost there. So, uh, yeah, the, the reason I, I reach out is I, I really want to get high-impact athletes known around the world. Uh, I want to get the idea of giving back more popular and, and mainstream culture and, and especially and more accurately the idea of trying to give really effectively. So... You know, there are literally millions of charities in the world yeah, and yeah. tens of thousands in New Zealand alone. It's incredibly difficult to know which are the good ones. And so what we do at High Impact Athletes is work with the best research organisations to identify the best charities. And if you just direct your donations to the right place, it can go literally hundreds of times further. So that's that's the message that I'm really passionate about getting out. Yeah, what do you mean a, a good charity in terms of like the, the overheads and how much of the money gets... It gets to where it's supposed to. Is that what you mean? Or that's definitely one of the yeah. metrics. So I think all of the sort of scandal stories in the charity space are, yeah, you know, like eighty percent goes to filling the CEO's pockets, and yeah. the the extra twenty goes to actually trying to do some good. So that's one aspect, and transparency is is very very important in this space, and it's probably not prevalent enough in the space. Um, but the other thing, and probably the most important thing, is measuring impact over time. So. It's really good to spend money on, on interventions that we think are going to be good, but if they don't turn out to actually have an impact over time, then they're sort of a waste of money. Yeah. And a lot of charities will do the output, so they'll, they'll measure the interventions that they do, but they won't measure, you know, like two years out, has it actually had a lasting impact, or five years out, has yeah. it had a lasting impact? So what really matters is the outcome, right? What really matters is that we're actually making a positive impact on the world, so... The charities that we work with, they, they basically 
do the best measuring. And yeah. if you do good measuring, then you you actually know what what your donation is doing, what the money that you're spending is doing. Why uh, you, you you mentioned before that you were um, sort of donating uh, donating yeah money under the sort of cover of darkness because of the tall poppy thing. Um, that must have been a big call. Like, so you're, you're a, you know you're a, you're a young pro tennis player in your twenties, probably not sure where your next you know checks coming from. I don't know. I'm guessing it's a week to week sort of existence. Um, that seems like a big call, giving away some of your money. Yeah, and to be honest, it only I only felt like I could when I started breaking even from tennis. So that probably I think that happened in maybe 2014 was the first year that I actually made enough prize money that I covered expenses and. When that happened, and, and that was around the time that I started focusing on doubles, I actually felt like I could have a career in, in this thing, you know, and actually put some money away in the bank, which yeah. was a lovely feeling after, you know, <laughs> dedicating 10 years of my life to it. Um, but then with that little sense of financial security, it was like, well, I had this really strong urge to give back. And sport is selfish. Like, all sport, regardless of whether it's team sport or individual sport, like, we're propelled by this really strong desire to sort of rise to the top and that's necessary like the selfishness is necessary but it never sat perfectly with who I wanted to be away from tennis and also for me it was you know like even when you're not making money from tennis you're flying around the world for 10 months of the year and and playing all these tournaments and carbon footprint's huge and that never sat well so when I when I first felt like I had the ability to give back it was like okay I, I really want to but how and that was actually when I discovered this this area of effective giving because, you know, like a good millennial, I jumped on Google and, and basically typed in, like, how, how to give back best or something like that. And, yeah, eventually came to this idea of, well, if you're going to give back, it makes sense to, to give back in the best way that you can. And being an athlete, you know, optimization is just part of the everyday vocabulary you know we're we're trying to get the most we can out of our bodies every single hour of training and just applying that same framework to charity made sense so with um hia high impact athletes um do you do you do like a percentage of your money each year how does it work so i i personally made a commitment uh at the start of 2021 to give a minimum of 10 percent right. for the rest of my life wow. and that like for me that feels really good it was a journey as well i started in 2016 i think was the first year i made a pledge at one percent and just built up over time but high impact athletes is it's more of a community and educational platform so we speak to athletes from all around the world we have around uh, over 165 athletes from over 30 different countries around 40 different sports who all want to use their platforms and their careers to do good and pledging is sort of the the biggest ask of our athletes so the pledge is two percent or more of, of annual income but athletes can come on at whatever they feel is right for them because a reality that I think not enough people outside of sport know is that the majority of athletes are, are really not not making a lot of money you know um, I know yeah geez it must be exhausting hardest way to make an easy living yeah yeah Honestly, I think so. You know, the, the amount, it's all encompassing what you have to put into it. And, you know, most Olympic athletes are scratching a living. It's the very lucky small percentage that actually do really well out yeah. of sport. So it's meeting athletes where they're at. Um, you know, if, if they're able and willing to donate, which, you know, luckily being from New Zealand, most of us can give something, whether it's, you know, the, the cost of a cup of coffee a month or whatever. Um, but the other thing that we as athletes can use is voice. And that's, you know, part of why I reached out is I think uh, for better or worse, and, and maybe this is undeserved in, in a lot of cases, but we have a louder voice than a lot of other people in, in society. Well, and yeah, you've got a platform. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the sport sector is mainly used to sell stuff, and I'm hoping that we can use that clout and that influence to, to do some good in the world. Oh, good for you. Good for you. So any, anyone that's listening to this, how is there anything they can do? Absolutely. I mean... <laughs> came up with a little phrase that I, I quite like, which is, you know, you, 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 you can be LeBron James or James LeBron, but every, <laughs> every dollar that you give does the same when it gets to the charities, right? Like, we're, we're trying to use the, the voice of athletes and, and, you know, create a movement around athletes, but ultimately we want all of the people who follow athletes to get involved. Like, that's, that's how I think the snowball grows, is people hearing good ideas and saying, you know what, that, that sounds pretty cool, and, and you know, if you go to highimpactathletes.org, sorry for the little pitch here. Um, no, not at all. Go ahead. It's It has all of our recommended charities. We don't take any cut of any money that's donated, whether it's from an athlete or from anyone in, in the public. 
Uh, and, you know, the, with these charities, you can just do a huge amount of good. I mean, one, one thing uh, is for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can give someone access to clean water, f- or three people, sorry, give three people access to clean water for a year. So if a charity is really cost effective, then that's the sort of impact that we yeah. can make on people's lives. And I think that's pretty damn special. Where does this come from? Is this just is it how you were raised? Is the rest of your family like this? You, 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 um, you, I don't know, you, you, it just seems like you're very immature. Uh, when I was your age, I was a fucking mess. <laughs> 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 giving money to a charity would have been the last thing. I, how old are you, 30? 30, 33. 33, last thing on my mind at 33. I don't know, maybe it's a good bluff. Um, I no, 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 it, it, it cannot be, a, I'm not, not going to accept your modesty, it can't be a bluff, like it's got to come from a genuine place, you're not doing this for clout. Well, so I, I think my family is generous in, yeah. in general. Um, I think... I'm I'm really really lucky to have an older brother who's always been a questioner of things and you know like I guess most younger brothers I'd copy him and pretty much everything when we were younger and and he's always sort of questioned what's right and wrong and had his own way of thinking about that and so when I was in my young 20s and I was sort of doing a, a university degree alongside tennis doing some philosophy papers came across a guy called Peter Singer, who uh, is probably one of the world's most influential philosophers at the moment. And he wrote a book called The Life You Can Save. And he has he has this essay. It's it's now become quite a famous essay. It's called The the, the Drowning Child Essay or something like that. And the, the broad strokes are... Sounds like a rom-com. <laughs> it's, it's definitely... It's a punch in the face. But it's... So imagine you're, you're wearing... A nice suit that you just bought recently, a yeah. nice pair of shoes. You're walking to work uh, and there's like a shallow pond, like a foot deep pond that you're walking past. And then you notice that there's a child drowning in the pond. And of course you can just walk in and say, save this child. But you realize that you're wearing your nice new expensive suit. Mm. And if you jump in, you probably ruin this thing that costs you, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. Do you walk into the pond and save the child? And No brainer, right? Exactly, right? So everyone has this emotional response. Of course you'd walk into the pond and save the child. And Peter Singer's uh, question to us is, well, why aren't we doing that every day? Because just because the child is not in front of us drowning in a pond for a similar amount of money, we can literally be saving lives in the poorest places in the world. And actually that's like this idea that a life is worth a life, regardless of where it is. Yeah. That's a, a real key part of high impact athletes because our money can just do so much more good in the poorest places in the world. So reading that essay and, you know, reflecting on my own life and what I could and couldn't do and how I wanted to act in the world, that was, it was powerful for me. And, you know, it it took me a while to sort of act on it, but all of those sorts of arguments I've, yeah, I guess just over time I found I couldn't turn away from them. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. I'd like to think I'm quite altruistic now. I'm quite reasonably generous, but that, wasn't until a point in my life where I was comfortable and established myself. Right. So the fact that you're trying to, you know, I don't know, like feather your own bed or feather your own nest, whatever you want to phrase it, and, and also give it at the same time, I think that's remarkable. Oh, thank you. And, I, you know, I, I also I think I'm incredibly lucky. I mean, you know, I grew up in New Zealand. Oh, why are a rapper, though? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pro, pros and cons to wind it up, but, you know, Loving family, you know, had all the support that yeah. I could ever want. And and just by virtue of being born in a high-income country, I mean, we're, like, we're, we're the lucky ones in the world. And, and I think recognising that helped me to be more generous early on. Because yeah. ultimately, like, most people in a high-income country can give, say, 1% of their income and not notice a drop in sure. the quality of their life. Yeah, absolutely. And so if that's the case, like, why not? You can If you can help hundreds of people. Yeah. So who, who's in your family? I know you, your sister is um, Jess from Jess's Underground Kitchen. Yeah. Who else? You got a brother? You mentioned a brother? Yeah, Josh. Uh, he's he's CEO of a fintech company now called Akahu. Um, he grew Snowball Effect, which is an equity right. crowdfunding platform from... He was he was sort of the first CEO of that. Um, yeah, very in, intelligent guy and, and is making some waves in the fintech space and yeah I think lucky to have siblings who, who push me along and we all pull each other in different directions what a high performing family so you're, you're almost like the loser of the family <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the dumb one in the family so. amazing wow god your parents must be so proud alright all right. Um, 
Okay, we'll go all the way back. So um, yeah, you're from Masterton. Is that where you are in the Wairarapa? Yeah, the well, I grew up uh, first few years. So I'm from a farming family. Yeah. Um, grew up sort of 30 minutes outside Masterton. And De- dairy farm or what? Sheep and beef sure, okay. or ram breeding yeah. more accurately. Um, and then moved about 10 minutes outside Masterton when I was about four or five to for us kids to go to school in Masterton. Yeah. And, and um, you, you were playing tennis from a very young age. I, I heard a podcast you did and you talked about having um, like a tennis ball hanging in a, hanging in a stocking. Yeah, yeah, that was mum's genius way of keeping me occupied for hours at a time. Uh, how old? How old are we talking? I like two. Like really? So it's kind of like Tiger Woods in a way. You know, you see footage of Tiger Woods um, on like TV shows whacking a golf ball when he's a similar age. Yeah. So you were just like hitting, hitting, hitting balls from a very young age. I was. I think the difference, if I remember Tiger's story correctly, it was somewhat forced on him, was it? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, it, yeah, for yeah. me it was, I just, I just dragged a racket around right. everywhere I was went. Was it a tennis family? Not like really, no. Nah. No. Yeah, well, my parents played. Uh, well, I guess recreationally, they they played. You know, they represented Wairarapa at at rep level, so they could play, mm. um, but never took it seriously. Yeah. Uh, but on at at the farmhouse, there's an old concrete court there, and you know, long summer evenings, they'd jump out and hit some balls around after the farm day had finished, and my older siblings would jump out, and so I'd want to jump out, and I think it just sort of, you know, it was just fun. Mm. And, and it was, it was purely fun, really, until I was probably about fifteen. Like, yeah, until I I moved out to boarding school here in Auckland to try and sort of be a bit more serious about it. But until then, it was just like a summer sport that I did alongside all all sorts of other ones. Yeah. Um, so, would you say you're naturally t- naturally talented, or you just did the hours? You know, there's um, uh, Malcolm Gladweller. He's got a book called The Tipping Point. He talks about the ten thousand hour theory, like ten thousand yeah. hours to get to get you know as good, pretty much as good as what you're going to get in anything. But you, I suppose, if you're starting at two, you would have got your ten thousand hours <laughs> under your belt quite a, uh, quite a young age. Actually, I, I think probably not because really? I, I didn't play that much. Yeah. You know, like yeah, I, like in summer I was doing all sorts of other stuff. You know, we, we were going hiking. Surfing from a pretty young age, like basketball. Um, yeah, I, I reckon I was actually behind the international level until I was probably sort of early twenties. Uh, Is in, that t- so? in terms of hours, yeah. Oh, um, but you, you, you were, so you, were you just sort of naturally good then? Because I heard stories about like you a, as a boy, like beating grown ass men. <laughs> yeah. Is that true, or is that what? Like why, you're, you're, why did Upper doesn't have the deepest pool of oh, talent? Yeah. But, like, if you, but if you're a primary school age kid, like it's still, yeah, beating an adult is still a big thing, I think. Yeah, so I, th- I think there was some natural talent. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, there was natural talent, and I think that took me, that took me quite far. It, t- it took me to like the top national level in age groups and that sort of stuff. But then... You know, so I, I went to Europe for the first time when I was 17, and that was a punch in the face. That was like... Oh, okay. you just realised how shit you were. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> for tennis, very small pond here in New yeah, Zealand. So yeah. I was like, okay, you know, I can just sort of... This is this is what I need to do to be a, a top tennis player. You get over there, and it's just like, it's a completely different level. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, the first three or four weeks that I... So I, I landed in Slovakia. And just jumped in the deep end in terms of training. You know, it was like sort of six, seven, eight hours a day. Couldn't straighten my arms for the first like four weeks because I'd, I'd just never done that sort of training before. And ultimately that was too much training. But yeah, man, it's, it's I think there's more of an understanding now in New Zealand, the type of work you have to put in to make it at an international level. But I just had no idea. Wow. Um, yeah, a couple of things. First of all, I want to know why you went to boarding school in Auckland. So you're in you're in um, Wairarapa. Why don't you go to like Silverstream or in Wellington or Boys High in Palmy? Why, purely why are... purely tennis. Uh, so how do you mean? What do you? There were maybe three or four schools in New Zealand that had a tennis academy where you could be guaranteed, you know, say two to three and a half hours of tennis training a day. Uh, Two or three of those are in Auckland, so I went to I, I visited a few um, and went to St Kent's for two years, um, and that was good. That was a stepping stone, you know. It was definitely a, an increase in the amount of training, and then ultimately I did my um, I did my last year of school by correspondence from from over in Slovakia. And yeah, well, why Slovakia? That's a really. That's a, it seems like a random place to. I mean, yeah. if you said Florida and you're going to Nick 
What's his name? Nick, Nick Bolteri. Yeah, like his training academy, which has produced so many champions. That would make sense. What's in Slovakia? Not, not much. <laughs> um, yeah. So th- I was working with a Slovak coach here in New Zealand, and he sort of convinced me that Slovakia would be a, a big jump. And yeah, I went over there. I think I'd just turned 17. And he took me to his hometown, which was like a like 50,000 people, this little town up in the mountains in eastern Slovakia. And you know, he, he was the only other person there that I knew who spoke English. And Slovakian's apparently one of the hardest languages in the world to learn. Mm. It's got an insane amount of different... Basically, it doesn't have rules for a lot of the stuff. <laughs> um, and it, it wasn't a step up. Uh, and so after a few months, you know, I tried to sort of get guts it out and, you know, I've inherited some stubbornness from my mother, so didn't really, you know, admit very quickly that it wasn't great, but then knew I needed to change, so uh, moved to the capital city, to Bratislava, and trained in an, a, an academy there, and to be fair, like, they had a few good tennis players at the academy, and, um, yeah, eventually spent, I think, between two and three years based out of there, and in hindsight, I'd definitely do it differently. Like, I'd, I'd probably go to college in the States um, or at least pick a, a country that was closer in culture to New Zealand. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's a lot at that age, 17. Yeah, and it's, Slovakia was different then too. Yeah. Like, it, it felt very post-communist. Like, it was it was pretty, mm. pretty grim and harsh and, like, a very different attitude towards people in general, yeah. I think. Like, the, the way I w- I'd describe it when I was there was you bump into someone by accident on the street in New Zealand, you both apologise, right? So, oh, sorry. You bump into someone there, they yell at you, you know? It's like this different sort of harshness yeah, or something. Yeah. Um, and I eventually I found it, I felt like my personality was changing there, so I, that sort of scared me. So I, I ended up leaving and, and then uh, found the coach that I still work with to this day uh, in, in England and was based there for a long time. Oh, is, that, is that Dave Samuel? It is, yeah. Yeah, so he... Um he he has a phrase called um, the Chapel of Bullshit, yeah. which I've heard you talk about on a couple of podcasts. What? Um, how would you describe the Chapel of Bullshit? The Chapel of Bullshit is when you believe your own excuses and you let them get in your way, where most excuses are bullshit. And yeah, that's <laughs> so he just calls you know worshiping at the Chapel of Bullshit <laughs> is just believing your own excuses and and letting them trip you up. And it's so I mean it. It, it really is. I think it's it's present in every different area of life, and I think in sport it just gets magnified, and you can sort of identify them more easily. Um, yeah, you know, like, and it and it. I think what 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 uh, conceived the Chapel of Bullshit chat originally was. I think I was playing a, a match, and it was really close, and we were in the tiebreaker, and the guy got a lucky net cord, and I lost the point. And I think I turned to Dave and was like, "Oh man, it's not my day," which is absolute bullshit, right? You're uh, in, you're in a you're in a tiebreaker, which means you're neck and neck, and you lose one point. And over the course of a match, okay, like there are pressure points and tipping points and that sort of stuff, but one point, you know, doesn't have to mean that much. Yeah. And that's I think what set him off. And um, yeah, it's it's fun yeah. it's fun actually trying yeah. to identify these these, you know, chapel of bullshit moments and yeah, catching yourself. You're smiling when you, when you say that. Do, uh, do, does he tear you a new one? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really? So I lost that match in two tiebreakers, and I thought I played pretty well. Like, I thought I fought hard. Mm, it's a close game. Close game mm. against a guy who was a lot better ranked than me. And So it's a game you should have lost. So you took But that's chapel of bullshit as well, okay. right? Like, right. Should, should doesn't really exist. On the day, anyone could beat anyone... I'm a good player on grass, we're playing on grass courts, like, should, doesn't need to factor into that Mm. equation. But so I'd I'd warmed down, had a shower, came out to chat, go over the match, you know, it's sort of like a routine after a match, and he was there with his sort of 2IC at the time, sat down at the table, and he just like launched into me for like an hour and a half, two hours, like he, and when he gets going, he can really go, (laughs) and he's like a, he's a big dude too, he's like 6'5", like heavy set guy, and... I was I was pretty shocked. I think the f- the first thing he said to me in that chat was, "You are a fucking tourist," and what he meant by that was, I thought that I was trying hard. I thought that I was putting everything into it, but because I was mentally letting these little excuses sort of wheedle their way into my brain, if you're not a hundred percent mentally there, then you're not there. Like mm. you're not trying a hundred percent. 
um, if that makes any sense. And yeah, then then he went on to the chapel of bullshit, and you know, it took me I think sort of twenty or thirty minutes to to come around. But then, so for the first twenty or thirty minutes, you were sort of like arguing, throwing points back at him, or I was defensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. because I felt like I'd tried hard, and then it started clicking what he was saying that oh yeah that excuse wasn't necessary or maybe I let that affect me more than I should have. And so, you know, over time I was like, okay, this this actually makes sense. And it was painful. I mean, but but that's the beauty of sport and how short the feedback loops are, right? Like you you can do something bad and you know pretty instantly like that it was bad and, and you can work on improving it straight away. Um, so we made an agreement that day that, going forward in training if I switched off I think the agreement was if I switched off for three shots in a row it was either two or three shots in a row then training over and we'd both agree on what was a switch off and what wasn't but for the first week or so I don't think I made it past like 30 or 40 minutes of training and it was just the the thing that shocked me and where I knew that we were onto something good was it was exhausting like I was exhausted after 30 minutes of training. Just like mentally exhausted. Yeah, but because you're so mentally switched on, it means you do everything physically better. Mm. And if you're doing everything physically better, then physically it's exhausting yeah. too. Like, you know, you take those extra sort of three positioning steps before each shot because that's what you should do and you're not just sort of coasting through a training session. So that was really interesting. And then that sort of stamina built up over the weeks and that was actually the start of me having more success in tennis was that conversation. Mm-hmm. So that 90 minute conversation, it, it changed your life really. Yeah, I, I would say yeah. it, it did. And I credit Dave with, with most of the professional success I had in tennis. Like I've had a lot of coaches and mentors who, who were a huge help, but in terms of sort of turning a corner at the professional level, then him and you know the, the years of work that we put in and that chat in particular I think really yeah. made a step change yeah let, let's talk about some of the um, professional success would the um, would you say the bronze at the last Olympic Games in Tokyo is the like the pinnacle of your career like without a doubt yeah yeah, yeah. leagues ahead yeah how good so that, that was the, the COVID Olympics it was postponed a year yeah so, I, you, so you've been to two you went to the Rio Games in 2016 and the Tokyo Games so I, I suppose you can compare the two so you had like a normal Olympics and a pandemic Olympics um, yeah, let's go to Rio first. So, how was the Olympic experience? You're a kid from Masterton at Rio for the fucking Olympic Games. It's it's such a cop out to say indescribable, but it's just like <laughs> just like jaw on the floor, eyes wide open, and it was Mike Venus's first Olympics as well, and we were just like. We had bikes in Rio. We're just like biking around the village, just like looking at everyone. And You're just, a fucking tourist. Yeah, yeah, we were absolutely <laughs> were tourists. And I would say it wasn't a normal Olympics in Rio either because there was the whole Zika virus scare then. So, you know, there was a bit of fear in the, in the air. Uh, the the Olympic village was um, was put together sort of last minute. You know, had, you had buildings that were sort of <laughs> malfunctioning. One guy, uh, Juan Martin Del Potro... Um, he was playing like a quarter final against Djokovic or something and his elevator broke down in his building so he was like stuck in the ele- elevator for an hour and a half. So, and oh, actually one time I remember uh, there were really high winds and, and we were, Mike and I were eating lunch in the in the food area and heard this huge smash. It's like, I think it was one of the biggest tents in the world and, uh, and this big slab of plaster had fallen down from the roof like 30, 40 metres overhead just in front of the door, like two metres away from a group that had just walked in because of the wind. And so there was stuff like that going on at Rio where... That's you chaotic. Yeah, you don't think of that as like yeah. the Olympic sort of standard. <laughs> you had like big signs like windmilling over the Olympic villa. Like it, it, was, it was pretty funny. But, um, but yeah, the atmosphere there was really cool and... Did you, did you see anyone of um, anyone of note? Like Usain Bolt, or uh, I mean, do you get photos with anyone? Or was it are you too cool to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's, it wasn't too cool. I just felt sorry for them. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Saw Usain Bolt. Um, one thing that actually really surprised me in Rio was so there's like Usain Bolt, who's he's just the godfather of Olympics, right? He's mm. like super famous. But then actually, the the ones who had the most attention were the tennis players behind that so uh andy murray was in the olympic village Djokovic was there 
uh, I remember sitting at the same table as the Williams sisters, and they just couldn't eat lunch. Like, wow. Eventually, they they actually just like tossed their lunch and left because they were just there was just a crowd wanting selfies every every twenty seconds. I felt really sorry for them. Like, you'd yeah, everyone's there doing place, a job ultimately, right? Yeah, and you think if there's one place that as an ath- athlete you can sort of relax and like be amongst your peers and just be there, it would be the Olympics. Yeah. But I guess because sports are so segregated most of the time, people don't see the other you know famous athletes from different codes that often so it still is a big deal but but yeah it's like it's it's a it's an outrageously special environment particularly in the New Zealand team because there's all of the all of the culture and the mana that they bring with them and all the hackers to to be uh, welcome to the building and and you know like you, you select a, a greenstone medallion when you arrive and it's all cut from one piece of rock. It's like we're all part of the same team and that sort of stuff, which on tour you, you're you most often playing for yourself. You have your country name next to you, but it's like it's pretty individual. Yeah. So to go from such an individual world into something that felt so team-oriented, that like it gives me goosebumps, man. It's, it's yeah, so cool. That's really cool. And I mean, you've, you've been to two... Uh, Olympics and you've got a medal to um, show for it, most people wouldn't end up with a medal. So I suppose just being there and soaking it up and getting that Greenstone medallion, that's, uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah, or already that special. And in yeah. Rio, Mike and I actually, we had match points in the first round and lost um, to a team that I think ended up playing for bronze and we were gutted. Mm. And it was always, it was spoken, like we, we spoke to each other about it pretty soon after, like we have to come back and we have to do better. So even in Tokyo, just getting the first round win, even that was just like a huge weight off my shoulders. Like, okay, you know, now have had some success at the Olympics and, and won't walk away from the whole Olympic experience having had match points and lost. Um, and then, then you know, coming away with some, some, some iron around the neck like that. Yeah, it's, it was emotional stuff. Yeah, how good. How good! So yeah, so that was a bronze at the um the the twenty 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 one games they were held in though. Um, what an experience! What a, they, I mean, it's where is that now? Where it's, do you uh, keep it? It not be in a bloody drawer. It's not in a drawer. <laughs> I have. <laughs> it's maybe the equivalent of a drawer. It's it's. I have a little bag that has sort of you know the memorabilia from that games. You know, like a sort of Japanese f- fan with the New Zealand team logo on it and. It's one of the cool um, bits of culture at the Olympics is you sort of exchange little pins with, with other nations and other athletes, and so you're all the pins from the different nations. And, yeah, I'm thinking, I haven't got around to it yet, but it, it would be a pretty cool thing to get framed at some stage as well. Oh, 100%. So you're, you're hoping to, to go to the next ones, right, in Paris? Is I'm that, hoping. Is yeah. that the plan? Yeah. yeah. And uh, will that still be um, playing doubles with Michael Venus? Yeah, that's... The only option yeah. I'd have, uh, I've never been at a singles ranking where I'd qualify for the Olympics. And well, can, can you, um, sorry, this might be a really dumb question, but I, I don't know, I'm guessing there's a lot of people listening that won't know either. What, um, wh- why are you so much better at doubles than singles? Tennis is tennis, right? Yes and no. So I think the best singles players in the world, if they turned their focus to doubles, would be very, very good doubles players. But the skill set is a little bit different. So... I like to think that if I'd been born 30 years earlier, I would have been a really good singles player because my my natural talent is more with volleys and, and sort of feel around the net and, and being sort of at the front of the court. But with the way technology's changed over the last few decades, the game has slowed down a huge amount. Serving is less meaningful. Um, and, yeah, net play has, has become less attacking. Like, because the courts are slower, it's harder to put the ball away and people on the baseline have more of a chance to pass you. So these days, that sort of skill set is much more suited to doubles where, you know, you hit a lot more volleys, the serve has more of an impact. Um, and I guess, like, to be quite frank, uh, the level at the top of the singles game, like, it's harder to make top 50 in singles than it is to make top 50 in doubles. Yeah. I think there's there's more depth. There are more people who dream of being top singles players than top doubles players. Although, even over the last sort of 10 years, that's actually shifting. Like, doubles is getting a lot harder as we go. Yeah. And so you and Michael Venus, how did, how did that partnership start? Uh, did you guys know each other growing up, going through the yeah, age groups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, um, 
you hate each other initially? Was he like your fiercest rival? No, so he's, I think, maybe almost two years older than me. Right. So he, he was more my brother. I think he was young for my brother's age group. And I don't think he'll mind me saying this. He was known as the loose cannon of that age group. He was <laughs> he was psycho when he was younger. Like, well, cheer, like chairs over the fence, oh, like Nick Kyri- defaulted Kyrgios. from matches. Like like Nick Kyrgios, but, but there was no sulkiness to it. It was more just like rage. <laughs> um, and... He's found ways over time to sort of chan- channel it, but uh, it's still sometimes there. Like, uh, I remember Mike's got unbelievable energy. Um, I remember playing at, at Davis. So we, we first uh, started playing together at Davis Cup, like when we come together to represent the country. I remember playing against the F- Philippines in Cebu, this island in the Philippines. It was the final match of the tie. Two, it was two matches all, so it was a deciding match. And the winner of this tie would get promoted to a higher group. And it was like three o'clock in the morning. So it'd been a long day. And there is there are two Kiwi fans in the crowd of probably like 2,000 around this court. <laughs> and the Filipino crowd were being intense that night as well. And he goes two sets to love down. Starts coming back. It's the muggiest conditions I've ever come across. So like... You know, you're changing shirts every sort of two or three games. And he wins the fourth set, so sends it to a decider. And I don't know where he got this energy from, but he just started jumping up and down like a kangaroo, and he did it the whole <laughs> fifth set. For like an hour, he, did, he didn't sit down at the change of ends. He just kept jumping. And I don't know where it came from, but he like saw his opponent was flagging and just channeled all of his like inner rage energy into jumping like a kangaroo won the fifth set six love or something like that and was just an absolute hero that night so yeah that's <laughs> he's he's found a way to channel whatever energy he has inside him into into positive energy these days so mm. good for him i suppose a, a relationship like that especially like a long-standing one it comes with its own sort of um you know dynamics and nuances and stuff like do you do you if, if things are getting getting you know, touchy with with each other, do you know to give each other a bit of space, or like, how, how do you manage it? Are you quite good at communicating if if there's something bothering you or something bothering him? You know what? The, I think this was actually one of the keys to us doing well in Tokyo was we actually we sat down when we first got to Tokyo and said, "How are we going to make this campaign a success?" And we actually met with Jason McKenzie, uh, one of the New Zealand sports psychologist there and said, hey, look, like, we're really serious about doing well here. Um, we want to know each other better. We want to know how to communicate, how to help each other in pressure moments. And we had quite a few conversations during during the sort of 10 days, two weeks before we started playing in Tokyo. And it was that was amazing. And then the other thing that happened, um, we got absolutely pounded in the semifinals at the Olympics. Uh, we lost six two six two against a Croatian team that they were on fire, but we we didn't even get a foot in the door. Like we didn't we didn't put up a fight in that match, and it felt terrible. Mm. And we went straight from that match to the practice court, and we're out there for I don't know two hours, two and a half hours, just like talking things through, talking through what would happen if the same situation came up the next day, playing for bronze. And it's that sort of communication and that sort of like vulnerability and, and yeah. openness to like what was going through your own head and like if you're open with that then maybe your partner can help you you know like even admitting like hey I'm a bit nervous you don't want to do that like you want to pretend that now nah, you're, you're ready like you're ready to Game go face. But, yeah. but if you admit it then your partner's got a chance to talk you through it and, and you know maybe you get a better outcome out the back so the, the way that Mike and I communicated during Tokyo um it was really cool, just even if the result didn't come out of it, it was, I think, a good way to go about it. But then I, I actually really do think it helped results-wise. Yeah, so you, you never you, ne- you never bl- blame each other? Or, or if, if you do, do you keep it to yourself? Like, if, if, you know, if you're, if you're having the game of your life and he and he's making some unforced errors or whatever, you you know, you just keep that to yourself or...? Yeah, blame, blame is yeah. toxic. Like, if you're having a crappy match, you know. Like, if, yeah, on, on court, if everyone knows. Yeah. There's nowhere to hide. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide. And most of the time, you know, because Mike and I are both 
pretty open. Like we'll acknowledge it on court and be like, you know, be apologising if we make a bad mistake or that sort of thing. And then it's the partner's job to say, mate, no apologies. Uh, we're here to win. Let's just do the best with what we've got today. And there are ways you can sort of push yourself through that. And it's all just part of the process of being professional. I think actually what professionals do better than, or, you know, like as you go up the ranks, what, what athletes do better is acknowledging that something's off and as quickly as possible figuring out the process of either minimizing the damage from that or working through it so yeah. that it's not a weakness anymore and actually i think that's that's the thing that i have the most admiration for with you know the the legends of the game is man they figure things out so quickly if if something's off and that's why it seems like they hardly ever have have a bad day yeah, when you talk about the legends of the game, who, who do you mean, like Rafa, Federer? Rafa, Roger, Novak, uh, yeah, yeah. even yeah, Andy Murray I'd, I'd put in that camp. Have you ever played any of those guys? Yeah, uh, yeah, I played I played Djokovic and Wawrinka at Queen's a number of years ago. Wow. I've never played against Murray or Rafa, trained with Andy and warmed up Federer one time and I, I sat on the, there's a thing called the A to B Player Council. Um, I sat on the council with Rafa, Roger and Andy for a couple of years. So sort of got, you know, got to see inside their head and, and get to know them a little bit, which was really cool. Mm. But um, yeah, they, they don't often play doubles. So it's yeah. a bit of chance. What's, how, did, how did you get on against Novak? We won. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That, Fuck, that must be satisfying. It was. We, sh- we should have won more easily as well. I think we both got a little bit tight because we're, like, we're about to be you know, one of the best players ever. But um, it was one, one of the most crowded doubles matches I've played as well. Um, yeah, for, the, for those, for the, someone like Novak, like when, when someone beats him, and he must just get a little bit of joy seeing the excitement on their face. Like, holy shit. Nah, man, he's a competitor. He's oh, really? competitor through and through. Yeah. He was not happy. Stan had just lost a big three-setter in singles and... His, I think his brain was wavering a bit, but you know, I'll take it. One hundred percent, any day. And so, um, th- this might be another dumb question. So, so, say, say you're you're a singles ranked player of I don't know, like five hundred. What's the difference between say five hundredth in the world and and best in the world or top ten in the world? Like, uh, can you still like win the occasional set off those guys? Like, is I suppose what I'm asking is 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 the difference incremental and in how you play on the day, or is it just as worlds apart? It's not worlds apart at all. So I'd say so I'd say there's a difference between the difference between 500 and say 50 is tiny. Mm. Most people in that range would hit the ball about the same pace and spin and everything. As you get closer to 50, there'll be a bit more consistency in terms of placement, uh, but most of that is mental rather than technical. And then when you go from 50 up to sort of 10 then it, I think there's a big mental leap there as well and when I say mental it's not just uh you know how tough you are in pressure moments it's like self-belief it's like do you feel like you belong at that level I mean one thing I struggled with at every level going up was you know shit I'm from a farm in New Zealand what what am I doing at this tournament almost you like know? imposter syndrome in a way absolutely yeah, yeah. yeah and and actually that comes back to tall poppy syndrome like you know what's this little kid from Wairarapa doing it on this stage um, and that's hard to get through, and I think most people to some degree have that, so they mm. have to work through that at each level, and the people who rise young, I think they've got like that switch turned off in their brain. I mean, you know, off the top of my head, guys like Kyrgios, Zverev, Bernard Tomac even, like, they're just fearless, like, it, and there's there's arrogance there, but it's like, it's almost natural arrogance. It's like they, they don't have to force it. They're just like, yeah, of course I'm going to beat Roger mm. at Wimbledon <laughs> when I'm 16 because why wouldn't I? I'm Nick Kyrgios, you know? Um, but then when you go from like 50 to 10, there's a, there's to be top 10, you're a freak. Like mm. you're not just a freak physically. And by that, I mean not only are you outrageously physical and talented – but you're also very, very robust. Like the stresses that you put on your body in, in the top 10 of singles is absolutely nuts. Yeah. But then the consistency that you have to have mentally week in, week out, day in, day out. If you're top 10, you've got a huge target on your back and everyone who plays against you in the early rounds of a tournament, that will be one of the biggest wins of their life. You know, you have like, it's a stat for every player. How many top 10 wins do you have? So 
you're like their scalp that they want to take. So you have to be on your game every single day. And that's, yeah, that's the the mental fortitude that those guys have. It's, uh, it's, it's scary mm. to me. Well, so, and so speaking of that, so you've got a, a BA in psychology. Has that sort of helped with your tennis game? Like I, I wish I could say yes, yeah. but nah, nah, <laughs> no, not n- not, nothing like in terms of like reading opponents or maybe it's reading. just helped me realise how messed up I, I am myself. But <laughs> God, yeah, because there's, there's part of me that's got a curiosity about um, psychology. I'd love to do papers, but yeah, the same reason. I'll be like, no, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to yeah, lift the lid, lid and look, yeah, look into myself that much. Yeah, I think like honestly, I think uh, the being in the sport and thinking about it and talking with a coach about it you learn far more about your particular area of psychology like sports psychology tennis yeah. psychology than I'd ever learn in a BA um, and I think I think it, you know different things work for different people so it's more of a figure out what works for me and that's a trial and error process rather than do a few papers and it's like, okay, I can apply all this theory to myself. It's, yeah, I think it's yeah. a little bit messier than that. Yeah. Um, have you ever read um, Agassi's book, Open? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the greatest sports books of all time. Unbelievable. Yeah, and so good. Uh, yeah, what's, um, so yeah, in, that, in that book, he, uh, I was going to say it's a love-hate relationship with tennis, but it's almost a hate relationship. Like his dad made him play at a young age, and he, he sort of loathes the sport. Has your like, love for the sport wavered over the years, or is it just just love for tennis? No, it's definitely wavered. Yeah. I, I would say I, I hesitate to believe the hate. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's still, he's still involved. Yeah. He, yeah. He, he hasn't needed to be involved mm. in tennis for decades, yeah. but he's still part of it. He's still part of the scene and stuff. So, you know... I understand the hate part, like it's, it, it smashes you, but uh, man, it's given him so much tennis. Yeah. And for me, definitely, like there were a couple of times that I came really close to quitting. Um, you know, we, we were speaking earlier, you lose, you, you fail in tennis pretty much every week. Like unless you're winning a tournament, it means you've lost. And I've won five ATP titles in my career, and I think I played at the top level so far for I don't know seven or eight years so that, that's less than one mm. sort of top level title per year and that means that I've had years where I've failed every single week maybe I've won a challenger title but you know that as you go up the rankings that means a little less so dealing with that and you know dealing with the sort of all of those emotions of like I'm not good enough what's wrong with me all that sort of stuff like it's 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 incredibly difficult and I also think it's the most valuable lesson tennis can teach you because if you can deal with that stuff, like I just feel like it arms you pretty well for whatever comes for next. life, yeah. yeah. How, how, how do you deal with that? It's, it's, hard, it's hard to think in outside of cliches with, mm. with this stuff. Like, you know, there, there are always learning opportunities and failure and there are usually more learning opportunities when you fail than when you succeed. And I think yeah, it's... so true. Yeah, it's like, it, it's sort of a... It's like a enough of a shock that it forces you to examine it, and I think some people, some people work best with being like, okay, I had a bad day, move on. But I've always been of the type that's like, what did I do wrong? Why did I do it wrong? And and how could I improve it? Um, and that's you know you you wade through the mud, um, especially if you play a, a bad game. Like you you know it's, it takes some time to sort of process yeah. and deal with the fact that you d- you didn't live up to your own expectations. Um, but that's yeah. I think that's actually that's part of the beauty of sport is, you know, I actually the guy that that I run high impact athletes with Hugo Angles. This this is one of his phrases. But it's like you know, sp- sport takes you f- from the ones to the tens, just like sort of week to week. And I think there aren't that many other areas of life where you experience those extremes of high and low mm, emotion so yeah. frequently. And it's hard, but there's also, it's pretty cool, you know, like experiencing the tens is amazing, but also experiencing the ones that it, you need that for contrast and, and... It's kind of like life really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like you need the lows to yeah, appreciate the, the highs. highs and, of course, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, it's like life. There's highs, lows, and then just a whole lot of nothingness. Yeah. <laughs> a whole lot of airports. Um, yeah, how's your... I mean, like mentally, it's kind of, physically, it's a tough game. Like, uh, that's one takeaway from the um, Agassi book open. It's like, he's in agony. Um, yeah. back, back issues, all sorts. Um, but mentally, tough game as well. Do, do you... Uh, have you seen the, the Marty Fish? Do you know Marty Fish or have you seen the documentary on Netflix? I've seen the documentary. Yeah. I don't know him personally. So um, yeah, the 2012 US Open, he had anxiety and pulled out of his um, fourth round match with Roger Federer, like uh, like forfeited the game like just before he was about to go on because he was having a having a panic attack. How's, how's your um, like mental state been over the years? Yeah. I think I think I've been really lucky, yeah. honestly. Um, you know, I, I talk about this with my wife quite a lot. Uh, Yeah, I think partly I think I've been lucky genetically. I think, uh, yeah, this is an interesting interesting one because I think I'm lucky genetically because I feel like despite experiencing lows and I think I've probably had a few patches of depression in my life, I never feel helpless. Mm. I always feel like this is a low patch. I'm really struggling, but I don't think it's going to last type thing. Is it circumstantial depression, like you've got a reason to be depressed, or, or yeah, 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 it's usually like injury. Yeah. I, you know, I've had oh, far yeah, too long with injury. Down. Yeah, um, even you know, yeah. The the last week actually, of a, um, I was struggling a bit. You know, I had a second surgery on my knee, and and actually feel like the surgery went really well. But you know, I haven't been able to really be active, and I find a lot of joy in being active in, in my day to day life. And and then I was sort of sort of getting to a stage where I felt like I could start being more active day to day and then I had to get this this little benign growth thing cut out of my back so it's like another week where I got stitches in my back and and can't you know not really allowed to sweat and it's just really struggling like mm, yeah. you know like this joy giver of being able to be out and about and get sunshine and and you know get the endorphins flowing so yeah I like I do think I've experienced depression but I think I'm probably luckier than most in that uh, whether it's through nature or nurture, I feel like I have a bit of perspective on it when, yeah. it, when it happens. Um, early COVID was another situation. I Oh, where were you? Were you in New Zealand? Or were you? I was here when yeah. it all kicked yeah. off. Uh, but my wife, so we were actually based in New York at the time and um, she was working for a law firm there and I was here playing Davis Cup. And New Zealand was going to shut down, and it was like, okay, what do we do? Like, we're in different countries. That's right. It was a mad rush home. It's like everything. Yeah. Sh- yeah. Kind of hard to get flights, even. Yeah, and I was thinking, well, shit. If I if I don't leave New Zealand now, maybe I won't be able to. Mm. And when will I next see my? Actually, she was she was my girlfriend at the time, um, and so I chose to go over there, and so I flew over, but didn't really have anything to do. Um, you know, the tour stopped. She was working ridiculous hours for that law firm, like, you know, sort of 16, 17 hours a day. So I didn't really see her that much. Um, and it was winter in, in northern Connecticut and went through a really dark patch of uh, just sort of purposelessness and, and um, yeah, waking up and being like, another grey day, like, <laughs> what am I doing with my life? Yeah, yeah. And But ultimately, you know, another, like, that was probably the longest patch of depression I feel like I've had, but ultimately ultimately it led to a lot of self-reflection and and then led to high impact athletes like okay well how do i want to act in the world how do i want to live in the world and and that was sort of what led to the conception of hia so i mean yeah really long-winded answer but i i've definitely been through low patches but i think firstly with i think a little bit of luck genetically and secondly with you know having having the resources with a coach that i could speak to when i'm feeling really down um, more recently to to have access to some of the Sport New Zealand psychs and and being able to have those sorts of chats like I feel really lucky with with yeah with how I've been able to deal with with those sorts of things and yeah you're quite good at talking about things you're quite good at being open and vulnerable I think so the the thing that the thing that I wonder is even now I'm wondering you know saying like I think I'm lucky I wonder if that's a little bit of the Kiwi play it down like you know yeah. like cover it up sort of stuff and whether if if somehow this shell was lifted off that maybe there'd be more there that I just haven't mm. allowed myself to access. Like it's one, one thing that actually I kept to myself for a long time. Um, when I was in Slovakia, I got 
pretty badly beaten up by by a few guys. Uh, I was on a night out with a, with a group of friends and just went outside for a bit of fresh air and got like bottled from behind. And um, so you're like 17, 18. I think I was yeah maybe like just before I turned eighteen or yeah. round round eighteen, and got beaten up badly. Like you know, bottled from behind, kicked on the ground, tried to like managed to get up, tried to swing my way out of it, but they they got me down again. Basically kicked me unconscious, and. I, w- I was lucky, like, you know, stitches, stitches in the back of my head, like a, under my eye and stuff. Um, and outside of that, you know, like, didn't have any, like, permanent injuries. But I, n- I never sort of acknowledged it, really. Uh, I'm <laughs> I managed to convince, so, you know, I had to get some brain scans and stuff because I was, I was pretty shaken up uh, and it cost quite a lot. Managed to convince the insurance company because I was under my parents' health insurance, medical insurance, or what, whatever it was. Managed to convince them to say to my parents that I'd fallen down the stairs and like tripped over a dog. Um, Why? Because you didn't want them to worry. Because I didn't want them to worry, yeah. and I just you know I like I was on this path of like trying to be a tennis player, and I thought my mum would say, "Well, that's it. You know, you're coming home. This is too dangerous." Type stuff, and and so just like took me a couple of weeks to recover before I could start training again. But just sort of okay, that happened not going to go to that place again and sort of lay low. Uh, and then I just carried on. And that sort of stuff, talking with my li- my wife, like, you know, over a decade later, who has a lot of experience with therapy and, and really believes in it and, it and its power to, to help people. And, you know, it sort of gets me thinking, well, what have I buried? What have I just sort of said? Okay, well, that's that's done. I've dealt with it. I'm going to move on. But, mm. you know, what's what's covered up and... Yeah, I just I just don't know. I don't know if I'm if I've actually been able to deal with those things because yeah. I, I feel like I have, but um, who knows? Yeah. Well, the fact that you can talk about it so openly, I think that's. Uh, I mean, that says you you haven't like buried it or necessarily right. compartmentalized it. I don't know. I think that's a good thing. Where you you say your wife's run into therapy? Is that um just the American sort of psyche? I think partly. Yeah. Um, you know, I, like she's her family. I think were were on the other end of the spectrum in terms of bad luck, in terms of, um, you know, like generational family history of addiction and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, I know she's she's struggled with, with bouts of depression in her life and anxiety and um, has done a huge amount of work personally. Uh, you know, she's she's been doing yoga at a very deep level. And by that, I mean, you know, like, beyond the physical movement you know going deep into the the spirituality and the sort of that side of it for probably about 15 years now and is a meditation teacher and you know meditates every day and and is constantly doing work on trying to keep herself level and and that sort of stuff and it's 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 pretty cool to see like you know she's she's using the tools that she feels best to to better her own life and um and therapy is just another one of those tools for her. Yeah, that's cool. Because I, I don't think there's a, like a one-size-fits-all, eh, I think. But I think you need to work out what's right for you in terms of, you know, your mental health and your happiness and your resilience and, and take it from there. Are you, uh, do you think you're a naturally resilient person or do you think you've built resilience over the years with um, tennis and everything else? I'd say it's a bit of both. Yeah. I think, you know, both my parents come from generations of farmers and I think there's... Maybe it's a generalisation there, but I think there's a natural resilience there or just like a get on with it and that sort of thing, which could be good or bad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, you have to learn resilience in tennis. The, the whole failure thing. If you, can't, if you can't learn to deal with bad times, then you can't be a tennis player. Mm. And I'm actually, one thing I'm interested in, so I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and you, you talk about your own therapy. Is this something that you... Do you have a, a regular a regular practice with therapy or is it something that you turn to when you feel like you need it? Yeah, I, I haven't been in a, in a couple of years, um, but I'm actually finding this podcast and these conversations kind of like therapy in a way. But I um, I put off going for... I, I never went until I was like mid-40s. Right. And um, I don't know why, but I was shit scared of going. I was like... I suppose, you know, 
part of it's fear of <laughs> what they're going to find. Um, yeah. Part of it is like uh, sitting with a stranger and being like completely open and honest and vulnerable. And it's it's like uh, you don't know where to start. And I, I went in for that first session because I was like, I need to sort my fucking shit out. So I went in and sat down, and then you you know you. Sp- I left an hour later and it was like a personal trainer for your head. And right. it, it makes perfect sense. Like, they're trained and they're going to make it easy. Yeah. So it's not like I had to sit there and go right back to the very beginning of my life. Yeah, so I, I found it a... I, I was actually mad with myself and, and embarrassed, actually, when I left that first session because I'd, it's something that I needed and I'd put off for years and years and years. And it was just dumb. Yeah. Dumb. Um, but it's really good. I'd recommend it to anyone. It's just a, sh- a shame that there's a lot of people that could really do with it, but it's, um, yeah, the cost is prohibitive. Yeah, and I think there's still, in the States, there's zero stigma attached to it now. Mm. You know, like, it, it would be normal in a conversation, even with relative strangers, to be like, oh, my therapist said X, Y, Z. And I think in New Zealand, that would still perk people's ears up, rather than just being sort of part of the normal discourse, you know? Like, yeah. mentioning casually that you go to therapy is, isn't yet as normal here as it is there. Mm. Um, but one thing... It still probably has a certain amount of stigma attached to it, in mm. a way, I guess, eh? One, one thing my wife has always said, uh, I'm not sure if I agree with it, and I'm, I'm interested in your take, is so she, she has regular sessions with her therapist, and she finds that the regularity is incredibly helpful because it's almost in the sort of the moments where you don't think that you have something that you need to deal with that it will pop up. Mm. And, and she said she's actually made most of her biggest breakthroughs not when she's in crisis, but when she's just in a regular session. Yeah. And that seems sort of counterintuitive to me. Like, I've turned to sports psychs and to the resources that I have if I'm feeling really bad. And it's like, okay, I feel really bad, I need to fix this. But then there's this whole other way of thinking of like, no, this is... Yeah. Like going and seeing a personal trainer every week. Yeah, I reckon you know? that, that makes a lot of sense. It's like ambulance at the top of the cliff, cliff yeah, versus yeah, the yeah. bottom. Yeah, I, I think, that, that, yeah, I think there's, a, there's a lot in that. But again, it's just cost, right? things. Yeah. Mm. How did you guys meet? We. She, she's super smart, right? Like Harvard trained. She's annoyingly smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't think you're any, you're a slouch either. <laughs> <laughs> I still <laughs> managed by comparison. I managed to beat her at word games, yeah. which really frustrates her. It's the best thing. <laughs> well, I like Wordle. You yeah, like Wordle? Yeah. like Wordle or um, Scrabble or whatever. She, she hates it. Um, but we we met actually. Um, we got match made by a friend that I grew up with in Wairarapa was doing a law master's at Columbia. And I got to New York a few days before my Airbnb started for the US Open. And, you know, I like always scratching to make ends meet. So rather than pay for a hotel for a few nights, I sort of thought, who do I know in, in New York that I could maybe crash on the couch for a few nights? And I got in touch with her and, uh, Turned out she was house sitting this beautiful like four bedroom house in Brooklyn for a while. Amazing. So, yeah, the the people who owned it said it was fine for me to stay, and so we were just hanging out. And she got it in her head that um, that she needed to introduce me to one of her friends while I was in New York. So I was just like scrolling through her phone and giving giving grades to to her available <laughs> friends. And she got to <laughs> what do you mean giving grades? Like, like B plus. <laughs> that's a D. Like in, in terms of what, like physicality or a whole package? Know. I guess a whole a holistic package, um, but she she got to Caro and it's, it's just refreshing that a, that a female is doing that. Yeah, I know, right? Like I was actually quite surprised myself. She got she got to Caro. She said, oh, "Caro is an A plus plus," but I think she's got a boyfriend. So, but she said, "You guys should meet anyway because you just have awesome conversations." So I was like, "Okay, cool, yeah, whatever." I'm I'm down to meet people who I'd have a good chat with and. In between that and actually meeting up with Caro, found out that she didn't have a boyfriend anymore. I think you know it was like a few weeks out of a relationship or something. But anyway, we're still we're still thinking like this is just someone I'm going to have a chat with. It's not it's not a date or anything like that. So we met up for coffee and a walk on the Hudson and and um, just ended up chatting for like three hours and didn't want it to stop. We both I had, I had training and she was um, so she she was doing a, a a law degree at Columbia at the time, that's how they knew each other, and we both had to split, but we didn't want the conversation to end, so actually organised to meet again that night, and that was, that that evening sort of felt like a date. And wow. Yeah. It's not nice, uh, th- those occasions in life, and it's um, it's very rare, but when, when you meet someone, and it's almost like time stands still, eh? 
It's remarkable. Yeah. Like you, you can go on a date with someone, it can be awkward, and there's just nothing there, and it's evident very early on. Or then there's the opposite, which is like what you guys had. Yeah, and it's for me, it's the the coolest thing about my marriage is I know that in fifty years we're still going to have interesting conversations, and that I just love that idea. Like she she spends so much time growing as a person, and pushing herself in different directions and, you know, like being curious and trying to open her mind in, in different ways. And that's always been sort of the way that I try to approach life as well, that, you know, we're obviously we're both going to change and grow a lot over the years, but I just mm. always think that we're going to be able to to push and pull each other in ways that will be challenging and, and I get excited about that. It's, it's cool to think that, you know, like I don't think boredom is ever going to be part of the equation. Oh, that's really sweet. That's really nice. Where, where do you think you'll um, end up remaining? New Zealand? Or That's a States? tricky question. Yeah. Um, you, don't, you don't have any kids yet, eh? Hey? We don't. We have a dog, which my wife... Um, <laughs> like a child she, that never grows up. If she treats the dog like that, like I'm worried how much she's going to spoil kids. <laughs> it's outrageous. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a dog guy as well, and I, I think um, kids end up doing things that annoy you. Right. So, <laughs> dogs are just perfect, right? They, yeah. They, you know, even the annoying stuff they do is tolerable, but kids end up becoming annoying. Okay, so, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that. I mean... <laughs> Although, you know, like the dog recently has done a thing where he started pulling her undies out of the out of the laundry and, and chewing through them. But she doesn't find it annoying. She's like, oh, that's sweet, you know. Like, just, just hers, not yours? <laughs> yeah, just, just hers. A little bit, a little bit miffed about it, to be honest. But, um, but yeah, no, no kids. We, we are, you know, we're hoping to have kids at some point. And the, the thing is, like I... I've I love New Zealand and I've wanted mm. to I've desperately wanted to live here for the last 15 years that I've been overseas like I you know I, I miss this place yeah. when I'm away um and so having you know I've sort of been forced to be based here over the last year and a half because of injury but man it's been so cool in so many ways just even even just being able to be grounded a little bit and not have to travel every week yeah um yeah, so you you messaged me um last week about doing this podcast and I said oh come around come around the following Monday which is today um you said in your first email that oh I'm, I think I'm going to be in the states yeah yeah so we're we're heading away Friday right so this is like this is the challenge I think is so she's really close to her family um really close to her mother and they live on the east coast of the states and that's a long way away um so uh heading over there for about a month and you know like the other thing is I like how small New Zealand is, and, mm. and I've never needed big cities. Like, I sort of run in the opposite direction from, from big cities. Well, so you live in Raglan now. Yeah, and it's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, it feels like a great balance to me of enough going on that I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything, but um, quiet enough that, you know, I don't feel sort of cramped. And yeah. New York was the opposite. I, I really struggled there. Um, oh, regardless of who you are, you feel invisible in New York, don't you? And that can be uh, nice, but... Yeah, yeah. And it's so... Life on tour is so hectic that when I come back from being on tour, I want to be yeah. able to relax. And it's for me, it was impossible to relax in New York. But yeah, so I like for her having you know a, a law degree from from one of the top universities in the world. Like it's it's quite limited what she can do with that in New Zealand compared to the states. What do you mean? You think um, it would open any door she wanted to? Yeah, it's just like so. So at the moment, she's working on a lot of. Um, for example, like false advertising law, uh, legal challenges to some of the biggest corporations in the world. So she works for a, for a, a firm that's based on the East Coast, um, but she can't, for example, go to the hearings. And, you know, one of the cases might be argued in the Supreme Court uh, in the future, and uh, she can't go and attend mm. that, which if you're a lawyer, that's probably, you know, like the Olympics of, of law, like... Yeah. If she's based in New Zealand, she can't pursue those sorts of career opportunities. Okay, right. And in a sense, you know, I've I've had the luxury of being able to pursue, like, with all of my being, a career in tennis for a long time. And she hasn't been doing it for that long. Like, she, she 
she spent so long studying and loved it, but you know, she's, she's only really been working for sort of three or four years and is sort of still in the stepping up process. So yeah, I suppose, um, I suppose that, yeah, for, for what you do at 33, it's like definitely in, into the second half or even tail end of your career. But for a, a law thing, I suppose she's just ramping up. Yeah. Yeah. And started She'll be peaking well. in her fifties potentially. Yeah. So it's like, how, how can, is there a way that we can have our cake and eat it too, where she has the opportunity for her career and we have the lifestyle that that we want to have. It's like it's a tricky, yeah, a tricky situation. And and post tennis for you, what's the what's the plan? Um, stay at home dad and just um, HIA. Yeah, <laughs> that doesn't sound bad. Um, sounds sounds idyllic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I the cool thing the cool thing about being injured is I've thrown myself at home backed athletes for the last year and a half, and I've really enjoyed it. Like it, I feel like it's grown a lot since then and it is something that I get pumped to wake up and work on. And I think a lot of athletes actually really struggle with, with what happens after sport. Mm. You know, the, it is a big void. You, you spend all of your waking hours thinking about your sport or at least that's, that was the case for me. And it was, you know, even if you're not at the t- tennis courts or in the gym, everything that you do outside of it is geared towards it. Like, what am I going to eat tonight? How is that going to help me train better tomorrow? You know, what time am I going to go to sleep? Am I going to, am I going to walk and explore this city, or is that going to be too tiring for my legs so I can't train as well? You know, like everything you do is geared around sports. So when you give it up, there's this big void, and you have to fill it somehow. And I feel really lucky that HIA is like feels like it fills that that void pretty well. Um, but ultimately, I want. Ultimately, I think every charity or every non-profit's goal should be to not have to exist, right? Like, ultimately, I want to try and solve the problem of of athletes just deciding that part of being an athlete is giving back in a really effective and significant way. And and if we do that, you know, if we can make it a norm in the athlete space, then we we don't need to exist anymore. And yeah. that's, that's the ideal. And then after that, who knows? Yeah. And um, so how's the body now? Are you, you on the mend? Are you on the way back? Yeah, I am on the mend. Yeah. Um, yeah, I so I had my first jog yesterday uh, after the second knee surgery, and you know it was like one minute jog, four minute walk, so very very light, mm. but basically pain free. And I've got a, a great team. I'm training out of Cambridge at the Velodrome there. Um, I have a great team that I'm working with there. Um, so the plan is the plan is get healthy, get strong, slowly return to tennis because you know after a year and a half of of not hitting balls, my my wrist is is going to take a long time to sort of get used to that repetition and and get robust again but the idea is to try and start with the ASB Classic at the start of next year Awesome and so when was the last time you swung a racket? Has it been a long time? Yeah I mean so after the first surgery I I tried to come back a few times and I think two or three times had a hit and it's just it's just in a lot of pain Mm. Um, so over the last year and a half I probably spent like an hour and a half total on court so the last time I really properly swung a racket was Australian Open last year. Is there, is there um, a fear that you, you know, your game won't come back the way it was, or do you think it's like a muscle memory thing? Or you're enti- you're entirely confident that uh, it's going to be sweet as? I think I'd be lying if I said yeah. I'm entirely confident. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's got to be a bit of anxiety there. Right, right yeah. Today. I'm entirely confident that I could get back to a level of... Uh, Of com- of I, I reckon I'm 100% confident I could get back to top 100. Getting back to top 50 level or like, you know, like challenging for the deeper level, deeper stages of Grand Slams, that's that's interesting because that's not just physical. That's like your your m- belief, your mind has to be really, really sharp and, and sort of um, y- you can't have any, any chinks in your self-belief there. So... Again, sort of going back to imposter syndrome, one thing that I'm going to have to be very conscious about dealing with is, you know, I always in the past, I, I worked so hard because I had this thing where I felt I needed to feel like I deserved results. Yeah. And that for me was, well, I know that I've put the same amount or more hours in than the people around me. And the reality is over the last year and a half, I've put, you know, I've put a fair amount of hours into my physical side, but nothing into tennis. So. Yeah. It's going to be figuring that piece out, I think. Yeah. Well, that's terrifying and exciting. Yeah. 
<laughs> and an equal measure. It's an interesting challenge. Um, but I, I feel like you're in a lucky position where it's like you, you're not you're, you're not going to be defined by tennis. Yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Well, I, I hope so. Actually, yeah. I really hope that. I feel like there's way more to you than just the tennis. And you know, it, it, would, cool. it would be it would be a privilege if whatever I've done in tennis gets forgotten about. Uh, because it's been overshadowed by high impact athletes yeah. or you know that sort of stuff like I'd consider that a big win yeah you wouldn't that be funny if 20 years from now oh fun fact the HIA guy <laughs> he won a bronze medal <laughs> yeah yeah that'd be cool <laughs> that'd be that'd amazing be cool. well hey best of luck with everything thank you so all going well we'll see you back on uh, tennis court yeah so um, I have to be really st- strategic yeah. about uh, when I start competing because there's all this protected ranking sort of admin um Ideally, I'm on a tennis court training at full steam by sort of October this year and hopefully competing uh, first week of next year. Oh, good. Oh, I, I, oh yeah, the um, Heineken Open. Yes, yeah. The Auckland Tennis Tournament. Yeah, hey, singles or doubles or both? Doubles, I, yeah. It would be impressive if I, could, if I could get, at age 33, make a second career out of singles. Yeah, I, um, yeah doubles. Uh, there seemed like a bit of hesitation there. Well, actually, you know what? I was thinking on the drive up here. I was thinking it might not be a bad idea when I start training again to train singles because it'll be a bit more repetition through the body. It'll be a harder version, like a more physical version of tennis through the body. So if I can, if I can be robust playing singles, then I can probably be ro- robust playing high high level doubles. And I think. Because I'm not as good at singles, I can probably get a lot of good competition in New Zealand on the singles court. So who knows? You know, maybe sign up for for ASB Classic qualies and 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 <laughs> see what I can do. But man, I, t- <laughs> I don't have any expectations there. Like I've got uh, negative expectations on on the singles court. Oh, uh, watch the space. Oh, what's what's Michael Venus been doing while you've been out injured? Uh, he's been cracking on. He's playing yeah. with uh, Jamie Murray. Um, they won an ATP title yesterday uh, in Geneva. Uh, so the the tournament in the lead up to Roland Garros. So the French Open starts either today or yesterday. Um, I mean, he's he's been truly world class for the last five six years. You know, mm. um, sort of hanging in the top twenty. And I've got to I I have to give a huge amount of credit to Mike because he sort of broke the seal in New Zealand. He won the French Open like 2015 or something like that proved to us bunch of Kiwi tennis players who were trying to make it pro that we could yeah. and being the first person to do that is the hardest and then you know yeah, it, you're it, the trailblazer right? yeah it, it helped me it was like okay I, I know Mike I know Mike's level he's really good but I don't feel like I'm worse and so like if he can do it then maybe I can do it yeah. and I feel like he's you know that was a gift to to a lot of other Kiwi tennis mm. players. Does that, so, yeah, sorry, I was just wrapping up, but I just think about the um, the dynamics of like a doubles um, scenario. Uh, yeah, how, like, how does it feel from your perspective when you're out injured and he's he's cracking on with another partner? I mean, so we like, we it, never we never played uh, the tour together. Yeah. We played a few tournaments here and there, but we've never had a long term partnership. It was always when we played for the country, we played together. Um, there are yeah, I'm going to be totally transparent here there there are some people that when they win i'm like ah, oh, you know like <laughs> that i could, that should be me but n- not with mike like yeah um yeah with with kiwis i feel like I, i'm just stoked when they win and, yeah. and i feel i feel like tennis is underrepresented in new zealand i mean it's a huge global sport and uh i wish it had a bit more recognition and a, and you know a bit more sort of uh, a wider community and and a bit more sort of uptake in new zealand so the better Kiwis can do, I think, the, the happier I am. That's awesome. Oh, you're a good man. Um, congratulations on everything you've done. And uh, I, I think uh, congratulations too for everything that you're going to do in the future. Oh, thank you. It's going to be a hell of a life. Thank you. And thanks for having me on and, and for you know providing a platform to talk about this stuff. I think the, the platform that you provide is really valuable, not just you know for you know people like me who want to talk about nonprofits and, and charity and that sort of stuff but also the the way that you talk about mental health and and being open with that side of things i think you know especially men in new zealand probably have a ways to go with that stuff and so 
normalizing it and, and sort of bringing it more into the mainstream is really valuable. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I've just been like overwhelmed really by how um, open and uh, transparent everyone has been that's been on the, the, the podcast. It's just sort of normalizing these conversations, eh, rather than just sort of like burying it in the shadows. Yeah. And yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's a really cool thing. Like, I'm, I'm 50, you're 33, I'm 50 now, so I was from, born in that and raised in that generation where you, know, you guys don't cry, uh, you know, real men drink beer, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's nice to sort of, um, like change that narrative a bit yeah nice oh yeah. well done hey Marcus Daniel thank you so much man good luck for everything thanks thanks for having me